Um, I'll move House File. What's the best way to view? Fifteen twenty-two to be referred to the Judiciary Committee. Yeah, I order. Eighteen seventy-nine. Eighteen fifty-nine. Read the right number there. Myself here. <laughs> and with that, um, we'll start taking testimony on the bill. And the first person on the list I have is Adam Dunnick. Again, welcome to the, back to the committee. And uh, um, if you want to give your testimony, state your name for, for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the House Labor Committee. My name is Adam Dunnick. I'm the director. Mr. Chair? Yeah. The author is not here, Mr. Chair, if that's of concern. Sure. Which bill are we on, Mr. Chair? We're on House File 1859. Representative Feist bill. And this, we've got a lot of testifiers, so we're going to start doing the testifiers while she be, as she's, before she gets here. She's in another bit committee. Mr. Chair, is there any uh, is there any co-author of the bill who could potentially speak at least to the initial points of the bill, just just for introduction's sake? Uh, Representative Berg is a co-author of the bill. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. But, Chair, but, but like I said, we'll get we'll start with the testimony, no, we have so we can because we have a lot of testifiers, so we can get. And I, I I fully agree with you, Mr. Chair. I uh, would just like just literally the opening introduction to to the bill that we're discussing. Representative Feist, or Representative Berg, you can do it from there. <laughs> Mr. Okay. Chair. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could maybe nonpartisan staff like walk through the bill? We could have one start part. Yeah, why nonpartisan staff? Why don't you walk through the bill? Chair and members, sorry, I don't have my uh, yeah. tent out. Mary Davis from yep. Most Research. Um, this is a bill that creates some wage protection laws mm -hmm. for construction workers. Um, some of them are similar to other um, employee uh, labor protections that exist, and then some of them are a, a new section. Um, they create a private lawsuit when construction workers are not paid by subcontractors or contractors for work on construction projects. And then there are some exemptions for construction projects. They're usually larger construction projects, not like uh, somebody coming into your home to work on a single family home or a duplex. But, but but usually larger than that. And that's kind of the overview of the bill. Uh, but if you are familiar with other wage protection laws, uh, being able to sue your employer for wages that you're owed, that's the gist of the bill. Okay. Mr. Dunnick, if you want to state your name for the record and, and proceed with your testimony. Um, the next person I have on my list after that is Simon Troutman, so Representative and just so you're ready to go. Thank you, Chair Nelson and members of the House Labor Committee. Again, I'm Adam Dunnick with the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and I want to say, say a warm thank you to <coughs> Representative Feist for carrying this bill for us. Uh, I can't wait to hear what she has to say about it as well. In summary, the House file 1859. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Representative McDonald. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Dunnick, but uh, don't we have to move the bill first? Before testimony, or I moved the I moved the bill. You did already. I okay. moved the bill to be referred to civil law, judiciary, and finance, and civil law. Okay, my my apologies. In the confusion, I did not hear that part. It's yes. Represent Mr. Donick. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and committee members. In summary, House File 1859 will ensure that construction workers subjected to wage theft have recourse to collect unpaid wages from contractors. General contractors and project owners will see the necessity to hire responsible subcontractors by placing the responsibility to prevent wage theft upon those with the most control over their construction projects. Compliance would finally be incentivized. Before I begin about the specifics of the bill, I want to talk about how unequivocally we are opposed to wage theft in the construction industry. It's bad for workers, it's bad for law abiding businesses, and it's bad for the community. We believe that general contractors subcontract parts of their job but should remain responsible for the labor subcontracted. Today, general contractors are responsible for safety on their project and they can be held accountable for that. They're responsible for workers' compensation on their job sites, too, and they can be held accountable for that. We are asking that wage and hour violations also be the responsibility of general contractors. For years, we heard from generals and developers that this sort of misclassification has created an unlevel playing field for them as a business. For years, we were also asked by AGC and other employer partners what we are doing on behalf of workers being paid off the books. 
Some may ask, why are we back talking about this legislation when a, a great wage theft bill was passed in 2019? The biggest reason is that we haven't seen much change in our industry since then. Approximately half of the multifamily work that's gone on in the Twin Cities and around the state in wood frame, drywall, and other scopes of work are still being performed by subcontractors paying cash under the table. In some ways, it took a high profile case of alleged wage theft for us to consider this legislation. And the workers that we assisted at Viking Lakes and Egan and across other projects in the Twin Cities were owed thousands of dollars over not just months, but sometimes years. But it's not just about one general contractor or one project. It's about the entire system. And unfortunately, there are many who are breaking the rules and benefiting from the status quo. And who loses? It's the workers. And imagine being one of those exploited workers. And you're going to be able to, uh, be able to hear uh, some testimony from some of those workers today. Being owed large sums of money and having no ability to seek recourse from your employer. We think of this bill as leveling the playing field between the worker and their employer. Because right now, they're being told, go seek recourse from your direct employer. When there's multiple tiers of contractors that are intentionally set up to make it confusing. We continue to meet with the AGC because it, because it is important for us to maintain a partnership with them. However, if they're not going to push for the sort of changes that workers deserve, we're going to continue to push for these changes to help us deter and eliminate wage theft once and for all. Any amount of worker exploitation is too much, and it must go. It must not go unchecked. We believe that the best enforcement on wage theft and paying workers off the book is compliance, and the best way to ensure that is that general contractors are held liable for all the workers on their site. Our goal is not for a bunch of contractors to be, in, uh, uh, to be caught breaking the law. Our goal is for general contractors to do the right thing. Hire subcontractors who have real payrolls. H hire subcontractors who have employees that are paid on the books, not cutting corners. This practice must stop, and we believe that this bill will finally help make meaningful change. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunning. Uh, Simon Troutman. Thank you, and Chair. You uh, my name is Simon Troutman. Oh. Oh, you're good. Hello. Feist, we've moved your bill and we're, and we're you. currently going through testimony. Excellent. Thank you so much. I apologize for being late. Amen. Should I? Say yeah, Rep things? Representative Feist, if you get your, catch your breath here. Um, okay. Do you want to just briefly explain the bill? We had, we had nonpartisan staff walk through it. And um, there is an amendment, but I understand that the amendment came in late and we're just going to talk about it and not put it on in this committee. Yes, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Representative um, Feist. Great. Thank you so much. Hello, committee. I apologize for being late. I was presenting another bill in another committee. Huh. And Representative so. Feist, that's something that happens this time of year <laughs> um, all the time. So, cool. Representative Feist. Well, thank you. So, um, just to the amendment briefly, um, that was the result of conversations to expand the exemption around collective bargaining agreements. And um, we did not submit it in time for this committee, but I, we wanted to make sure that the committee saw it, just to know that conversations are ongoing, uh, to make sure that this bill. Um, has the effect intended. And we are in a lot of conversations. We appreciate those conversations. Um, so this bill is to address wage theft. Uh, wage theft is so common in construction that labor experts say that it amounts to a business model. Um, one in five workers in Minnesota is likely to experience being misclassified, paid off the books, uh, or have their wages stolen. These workers often don't even know who they're working for. Uh, 2019 law that we passed has had has been a positive step forward, but this issue remains prevalent. Um, the wage theft um, impacts approximately 23% of construction workers, um, and and uh, this is a business model that's been set up for the purposes of profiting from the exploitation of largely immigrant construction workforce, um, and and so. Um, this is a really important issue that we're trying to address. Um, it's found on about 50% of multifamily construction projects under the drywall, wood framing, painting, roofing, and siding scopes of work. Um, it's rarely found on projects uh, covered by prevailing wage laws or on union projects, which is why we have that exemption for collective bargaining agreements, um, which we're looking at expanding, um, because those workers have recourse on those projects to ensure that they are paid properly. 
Um, this bill provides that recourse to these workers who have been victimized by wage theft. Contractors engaging in the subcontracting of labor on their construction projects will be liable for the unpaid wages and damages stemming therefrom of the subcontractors performing work that is under their control. This bill applies to construction contractors and project owners if they are hiring multiple contractors who subcontract construction labor under their control. This will ensure that the construction workers subjected to wage theft have recourse to collect unpaid wages from contractors and to incentivize hiring of responsible contractors by placing the responsibility to prevent wage theft upon those with the most control over construction pra labor practices. Um, eight other states have passed similar laws um, to the one that is before you today. Um, and the bottom line is that if you control the work site, then you can prevent wage theft. Um, if you have access to the information on reputations and past actions of the co possible subcontractors, you have control over wage theft. A uh, subcontractor committing wage theft will have a bid about 30% lower than a legitimate subcontractor's bid would be. So you can see by the bid itself um, if you might have a wage theft problem. Um, you can choose to subcontract for skills that as a construction manager you could hire and supervise directly. So you're making a choice to subcontract um, with a subcontractor. Um, this bill provides more tools uh, to enable general contractors to prevent that wage theft by requiring the contractors um, are entitled to a variety of information. Um, and this bill levels the playing field. Um, between those that do care and have very ethical business practices. And I've talked with a lot of folks um, who work um, with general contractors who do have ethical business practices who work with those, those general contractors. And we want to level the playing field so that the ethical business practices um, can, can win the day and they're not going to be underbid by unethical subcontractors. Um, and this bill is also designed to um, avoid unintended collateral consequences. Again, it has been passed in um, numerous other states. Um, and I just want to um, highlight that there are significant exemptions, which we are working on to um, expand, um, including single family and two family dwellings, home remodels. So if I hire contractors, I'm not going to be subject to this as a homeowner. Um, and again, prevailing wage projects um, where there is already recourse in place for workers and um, collective bargaining agreements where we are, again, we're expanding that exemption. Um, investigative resources are so scarce that even bad actors right now are not getting caught. So um, this concern that there's just going to be these floodgates and all of this, you know, investigation of, um, you know, people, general contractors and project uh, managers who are doing the right thing. Um, you know, we do not expect that to happen. There haven't been investigations of even really bad, egregious um, examples of wage theft. Um, and I could say a lot of other stuff, but I guess I'll, I'll just close by saying that I appreciate um, all the conversations I've had with folks who have concerns about this bill. Um, and I am committed to continuing those conversations um, because I think that's what we do for good governance. And so um, I look forward to the conversation today and I'll leave it to the experts and the workers at this point. Thank you, Representative Feist. And again, Mr. Mr. Troutman, go ahead and identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you so much for, for having us here today. My name is Simon Troutman. I'm a Richfield City Council member. I'm also an attorney that fights wage theft and also represents uh, contractors. And, uh, and I am the chair of an organization called City Leaders Against Wage Theft and Tax Fraud. And we're here today. We represent uh, more than 20 local municipal leaders who believe and are committed to the proposition that wage theft is some of the worst theft that takes place in Minnesota or anywhere where you take money from working people after they've traded the only thing that they have in, in the world oftentimes. We know in Minnesota, more than one in two Minnesotans would struggle to make a payment of $500 in an emergency if they had that. And there's no time where someone is more vulnerable than when they've traded their labor for a promise to be paid. And in the, the situation where we have, we have wage theft, where we have, and I think appreciate uh, the, the comment that this is a, a business model. We have a, we have a situation, a policy position where ignorance from the contractor is incentivized and theft is rewarded. And the only thing I would add to Mr. Dunnick's testimony is that in addition to the workers, and you're gonna hear powerful stories from workers who've had their wages stolen, but also good faith actors that uh, are losing out on on great contracts, but also the government. We have a bipartisan group of people who don't like uh, um, taxes being stolen from, from the government. So we miss those opportunities. And in, and in the wake of that, we have, um, we have an inability 
uh, people who've had their wages stolen to be held accountable. For those that aren't familiar with the practice, you'll have a subcontractor that has an LLC with zero assets. And so that creates an opportunity, a policy problem, where there is literally no money. There's literally nobody accountable. And the person who's most accountable, who's in the best position to be able to make sure that the laws are complied, that taxes are paid, and that workers who've worked get paid is the general contractor. So what we're asking is that you would earnestly consider the consequences in your districts, on your block, if on your block, three or four out of 20 of the homes on your block had been broken into and stolen. If one in two Americans can't pay a $500 bill and one in five of those Minnesotans in the trades have been the victim of wage theft, we're asking for the tool to hold them accountable. As a lawyer, we need this tool. As a council member, we need this tool. And for all the workers who are here, we earnestly ask you for this opportunity to be paid for the wages they've, they've worked for. This is a sacred trust, and we're grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Troutman. The next person on my list is Flavio Marino, and I, I know I probably pictured that name. Welcome to the committee. Again, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Presidente Representante Michel Neso. Gracias, señor presidente y miembro del Comité de la Cámara. Mi nombre es. Angel Polivio Merino. All right, and my name is Diana Solorsano. I am representing Mr. Polivio to help him interpret his testimony. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and House Committee members. My name is Angel Polivio. Trabajo en la construcción. Estoy aquí para apoyar el archivo 1859 de la Cámara. I work in construction. I'm here in support of House File 1859. Esto requeriría que los contratistas y de desarrolladores sean responsables de las acciones de los subcontratistas que contratan en sus lugares de trabajo. This would require contractors and developers to be responsible for the actions of, of the subcontractors they hire on their job sites. Uh, los contratistas ya no podrían ignorar la clasificación errónea y el robo de salarios en estos lugares de trabajo. Deben estar y estarán obligados a contratar empresas que utilicen sistemas de nómina legítimos para pagar a sus trabajadores o ser considerados responsables. No longer would contractors be able to ignore the misclassification and wage theft on these job sites. They should be and will be obligated to hire companies who use legitimate payroll systems to pay their workers or be held responsible. Finalmente, los trabajadores duros como yo no serían explotados por compañías que operan usando un modelo de negocio de robo de salarios. Finally, hard workers like myself would not be exploited by companies operating using a wage theft business model. Hace aproximadamente dos años que yo trabajé en un proyecto que se llama Pastor My Apartment. Approximately two years ago, I worked at a project for uh, Pastor's Apartments. En el cual me ofrecieron un precio a pagar que yo estaría como encargado y conseguiría más gente para trabajar en él that for a specific payment i would be the uh, i would be in charge and would need to hire workers for this project y siempre que yo estaba encargado y conseguía más gente siempre me exigían más y más pero el salario nunca me lo aumentaron whenever whenever i was in charge um, i was in charge of hiring more and more people for this project and getting more responsibilities but never in received any increase in payments En lo cual que me ofrecieron un precio y me llegaron pagando a 75 centavos el, el pie cuadrado. In which they told me a specific amount, but ended up paying me 75 cents per square foot. Y pues um, me hicieron que yo les agarrara unos cheques para que yo pueda trabajar, pagar, perdón, a los compañeros que traía yo de trabajo. Um, they made me cash in some checks so I could pay the workers that I had brought in. En el cual yo no era el contratista. In which I was not the um, subcontractor. 
Ah, luego de eso, pues no nos pagaron todo y luego de eso me fui de este trabajo también a hacer unas casas que también no me pagaron. After that, I wasn't paid um, for the work that I did, so I took work somewhere else to help build some houses where I also wasn't paid for this work. Entonces, pues, les quería pedir que si podemos o nos pueden ayudar en esto terminar con esta pandemia. Um, so that's why I'm here today to ask you for help so you can help end this pandemic. Bajo esta legislación, la empresa que contrató a este intermediario laboral y dueño de Yellow Tree sería responsable ya que nos pagaban en efectivo y nunca hubo una nómina. Podrían haber requerido a Yellow Tree. Under this legislation, the company that hired this labor broker and owner of Yellow Tree would be responsible since we were paid in cash and there was never any payroll. En mi caso, para proporcionar pruebas de nómina y fácilmente, se habrían enterado de que estábamos siendo victimizados. They could have required Yellow Tree, in my case, to provide proof of payroll and they would have easily learned that we were being victimized. Esto podría proporcionar responsabilidad directa sin hacer más la vista gorda y los trabajadores como yo en todo Minnesota podrían cobrar parte de sus salarios impagos. This could provide direct liability, no more turning a blind eye, and workers just like me all over Minnesota would be able to collect some of their unpaid wages. Es un paso en la dirección de tratar a los trabajadores con dignidad y respeto. This is a step in the right direction, treating workers with dignity and respect. Muchas gracias, señor presidente y miembros por su tiempo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of, for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, Octavio Chung is the next person. And then after that, then if you get ready, is uh, Alvarez Chavez. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair Nelson and committee members, for the record, my name is Octavio Chong Bustamante. I'm an organizer for the Labor's Union, La Yuna. I'm originally from Panama, and my wife is from Minnesota, and we now live in Hugo. When I came here, I had to review my entire life. Other than my wife, I did not know anyone I could not speak well, as you can't, but. Like many Latino immigrants, I found work in the construction industry, but I was lucky. My employer paid family supporting wages and provide union health, retirement, and training benefits. Equally important, they pay their taxes, unemployment, and workers' compensation premium. If I was laid off because of uh, work was slow, I had unemployment insurance to get me and my family through. If I or one of my coworkers, coworkers got hurt on that job, we receive proper medical care. Sadly, many workers are not so lucky. Part of my job as an organizer with Layuna is to prevent irresponsible contractors from getting ahead by cheating workers, workers and taxpayers and, un and undercutting law obedient comp competitors by breaking the law through tax or and insurance fraud. Here is, a, here is an example. Last year, I assisted a worker named Marco who had recently broken his ankle after filing of a letter in a construction project. The general contractor of the project was a subsidiary of a multi-billion dollar building supply company. When Marco was injured, his direct boss, a so-called independent contractor, should have arranged medical treatment for him and help him file a workers' com compensation claim. Instead, Marco and a coworker explained to me that their boss tried to persuade Marco to lie to authority and seek medical care under the boss's name at taxpayer expense. Marco said that when he refused to participate in the scheme, the boss responded by firing him and his coworker and by threatening to report them to, to the police and immigration enforcement. Marco's injury prevented him from working in construction and he faced thousands of dollars in medical debt while the lawyers argue over who should pay the bills. This is not how the system is supposed to work, but I can tell you, based on my experience, stories like Marco are far too common. The nightmare that workers like Marco face on a daily basis won't end 
until we start holding general contractors responsible for abuses that happen under watch. Under current law, general contractors like the one that hired Marcos Bass don't face any real consequences for using subcontractors that ex exploit workers and cheat taxpayers. We have shared evidence of wage theft and other abuses with general contractors on many occasions, but our pleas have largely been ignored because they clearly don't seem because they, they clearly don't seem as it is their problem. House file 1859 will level the playing field for responsible contractors and ensure contract contractors that en enrich themselves at the expense of workers and taxpayers are held accountable. I ask you all to support this proposal. Thank you to Representative Pace for introducing a bill that will better serve and protect construction workers who often don't know their rights or where to turn for help. And finally, Chair Nelson, I want to remind members of the committee that this issue affects real people. The workers are building our remarkable communities in every corner of the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Uh, Alvarez Chavez. And then the next person on my list is Dan McConnell. So if you can be ready. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. And then proceed with your testimony. Okay. Mi nombre es Alvaro Chavez. And I, I'm assuming you're... My name is Alvaro Chavez. My name is Carlos Garcia Velasco. I'm here to interpret an elite organizer with a worker well, center. I, that's what I assumed, yes. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Chavez. Mi nombre es Alvaro Chavez. Vivo en San Paul con mi novia. He trabajado en la industria de la construcción desde hace cuatro años. Conozco los problemas de la industria de la hace 17 años por la experiencia de mi papá, quien ha sufrido a uh, todos estos años las situaciones de abusos al trabajador, incluyendo robo de salario. Desde que empecé, he sufrido el robo de salario, maltratos verbales y pagos injustos para los riesgos y esfuerzos que hacemos. En mi caso y el de mi padre, nunca hemos recibido un pago por tiempo extra y nos ha pasado accidentes sin recibir una compensación laboral. No recibimos ningún beneficio porque éramos clasificados como contratistas independientes. Me siento enojado viendo que mi papá sufre tanto y eh, un día le dije a mi papá que buscara uh, en otro lugar un trato justo y un mejor pago mientras yo seguía en este grupo para pagar nuestros gastos. He trabajado con diferentes grupos y siempre es la misma historia. En julio de 2021 empezamos un edificio multifamiliar un proyecto aquí en University Avenue, en St. Paul, en que Yellow Tree fue el contratista general. Trabajábamos jornadas de 10 a 11 horas y nunca recibimos un pago por trabajo de tiempo extra. Fue un trabajo muy pesado y me lastimé la espalda. Otro compañero también tuvo un accidente en el trabajo. Como no teníamos los beneficios médicos que un trabajador debe tener y tampoco ganábamos lo suficiente para pagar Por nuestras cuentas, los cuidados médicos nunca se trataron nuestras lesiones. Nos forzaron a hacer lo más difícil del trabajo en el primer piso del edificio, con la promesa de que íbamos a hacer todo el proyecto. Pero cuando estábamos terminando la planta baja, nos sacaron del proyecto y pusieron a otro grupo a hacer lo que nosotros estábamos haciendo. Nos sacaron sin pagar por el trabajo hecho. Cuando el encargado del grupo llamó al dueño de la compañía Strong Freeman, un subcontratista, en este proyecto no contestó el teléfono para evitar el pago. Buscamos ayuda en la unión de carpinteros y así conocimos a Desetur. Se inició el proceso de reclamo, pero no sabíamos a quién era responsable de pagarnos, ya que la persona que, contrató, que nos contrató, no contestaba el teléfono. Tomamos la decisión de llamar a Yellow Tree y nos dijeron que ellos habían contratado a Jules Freiman para hacer el trabajo, que le llamaran a ellos. Jules Freiman dijo que ellos contrataron a Strong Freiman, la compañía de la persona que nos 
que no nos contestaba. Ninguna de estas compañías querían tomar responsabilidad para pagar nuestros sueldos. Esta es una historia muy común en la industria de la construcción. Por eso, mi papá y mi hermana me motivan a actuar y levantar mi voz para dar a conocer las injusticias que sufrimos. Nosotros trabajamos para suplir necesidades de nuestras familias. Somos los que hacemos el trabajo duro y cu para cumplir en los proyectos, exclusivamente arriesgando nuestra salud. Parece que los contratistas generales como Chelo Tri no quieren pensar en las problemáticas que pasa con los trabajadores. Parece que están preocupados solamente por su dinero. Aprobar esta ley marcaría la diferencia para los trabajadores como yo, que estamos enfrentando el robo de salario frecuentemente. La ley de robo de salario de 2019 fue un paso importante, pero también necesitamos una ley más enfocada en las necesidades de la industria de construcción, que nos garanticen que los contratistas generales se responsabilicen y garanticen tratos y pagos justos a los que hacemos el trabajo difícil y duro. Gracias por la oportunidad de darnos a conocer mi historia y la ley y de la, muchos que por miedo de represalias no se atreven a denunciar las violaciones de sus derechos. Les urge apoyar esta ley. My name is Alvaro Chavez. My girlfriend and I live in St. Paul. I have worked in construction for four years. I have also seen the problems that exist for workers in the industry through the experience of my father, who has suffered many abuses for the last 17 years, including wage theft. Since I started working in construction, I have experienced wage theft, verbal abuse, and pay that isn't, a, isn't sufficient for the hard and dangerous work that we do. In my case, and in my father's, we have never received overtime pay and we have had accidents at work but didn't receive workers' compensation. We haven't received those benefits because we were misclassified as independent contractors. I felt angry seeing my father suffer so much, and I told him to look for other work where he is treated better and has better pay, and I continued working in con construction to make sure we could pay our bills. I have, started with I have worked with various different crews, and it's always the same story. In July of 2021, we began to work on a multifamily project on University Avenue here in St. Paul, where Yellow Tree was the general contractor. We worked 10 to 11 hour days, and we never received overtime pay. It was really difficult work and caused me to injure my back. Another coworker also had an accident on the project. Because we didn't have workers' compensation insurance or other benefits, and we didn't also make enough to pay for our own medical bills, we were never able to get our injuries treated. We were forced to do the most difficult work on the first floor of the building with the promise that we would be able to work on the rest of the project as well. But when we finished the lower floor, they took us off the project and hired a different group to do the work we had been doing. They never paid us for the work we had already done. When the supervisor for our group called the owner of the company, Strong Framing, who was a subcontractor on this project, he wouldn't answer the phone. We contacted the Carpenters Union for help, and that's how we were connected with Saytool, uh, a worker center. Uh, we began the process of filing a wage complaint, and we didn't know who was responsible for paying us since the person who had contracted us wasn't answering the phone. We made the decision to call Yellow Tree, and they told us they had contracted with U.S. Framing to do the work, and we should call them. When we called U.S. Framing, they told us they contracted with Strong Framing the company of the person who was no longer answering our calls. None of these companies wanted to take responsibility for paying our wages. This is a very common story in, in, in the construction industry. And this is why my father, my sister, and I were motivated to act and to speak out about the injustices that are happening. We work to be able to take care of our families. We are the ones who do the hard work to complete those projects, sometimes risking our health. It seems that general contractors such as Yellow Tree don't want to have to think about violations of workers' rights that may occur on their projects. It seems that they are only concerned with their financial investments. Passing this law would make a big difference for workers like me who are frequently dealing with wage theft. The wage theft law of 2019 was an important step, but we also need a law focused on the needs and problems in the construction industry, one that guarantees that general contractors will take responsibility and guarantee that we are paid what we are owed for doing the hard work. 
Thank you for the opportunity to tell my story and the story of many other workers that haven't come forward yet for fear of retaliation. We urge you to support and pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dan McConnell, the next day of Tim Workey, and if we can limit it to two to three minutes, it would be great because we got <coughs> a few more testifiers and we needed to have discussion of this bill. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. Good afternoon, Chair Nelson, members of the committee. My name is Dan McConnell. I'm the president of the Minnesota Building and Construction Trades Council, and I'm here on behalf of the 70,000 members who live in every corner of our state. It's a privilege for me to be here and to testify on this bill. On behalf of the building trades, I'm here to speak in favor of House File 1859 because wage theft has become a, has, has been and continues to be a serious problem in the construction industry. Every day, general contractors make decisions about who does different scopes of work for them on their projects. They decide what they perform and what they subcontract out. They make decisions and are being and are held accountable for many of those decisions, from safety to worker comp to schedule, and who is paid on their project. Managing the project and making sure everyone is paid is literally what owners pay a general contractor to do. Even though we passed a wage theft bill in Minnesota in 2019, nobody who works in this industry can honestly say that the problem is solved. It's going to take all of us to solve this problem, federal, state, local decision makers, construction trades unions, and our contractor partners. We have a track record of working with our contractors collaboratively. For example, we work together on employee benefit programs, our joint apprenticeship training programs, recruiting workers, and on advocating for jobs for our members. Now we need our general contracting partners to come to continue to step up on this issue of workers being paid cash under the table. It's unlawful, it's worse, and it's morally wrong. Most of the general contractors we work with do the right thing, but as often as the case, it only takes a few bad apples to ruin it for everyone. When competing for jobs, contracts are awarded to the lowest bidder. The incentive to engage in unscrupulous behavior or to simply look the other way can mean the difference between getting the next job or losing it to a competitor who is willing to do it, the unlawful acts, and then potentially going out of business yourself. We're glad to hear the AGC has called for more government oversight and for funding for enforcement of existing laws. We agree with that call, but are skeptical that there will ever be enough external eyes to watch every project throughout our state. This bill will empower every worker to be part of the solution to this problem. Doing nothing is not an option when so many workers are being hurt, mistreated, and taken advantage of. It's going to take everyone working together. And I ask the Labor Committee and the House to pass this Construction Worker Wage Protection Act to empower workers who have been victims to hold their bad actors accountable. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Uh, Mr. Workey, the next person I have on the is Wendy Sullivan. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Tim Workey. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Associated General Contractors of Minnesota. We represent over 350 commercial general contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers. We are 80% of our members are union signatory contractors, and we, we perform strictly commercial construction work, no residential. Mr. Chair, some key points with respect to this bill. Let me first begin by saying no one in our membership condones wage theft, period. Our position on this bill is that the legislation as currently written is misguided, provides an unworkable construct, and places heavy burdens on general contractors only with significant market consequences. We believe further that efforts to curb wage theft are best focused on building out the 2019 wage theft law by fully funding it and in so doing, honoring the $3 million request for additional investigative staff that the Department of Labor and Industry has in their current budget. Over the past six to eight years, there have been several major wage theft initiatives passed by this legislature, each promising an end to wage theft, and we have participated actively in the development of those laws. We do not need more legislation. What we need is a greater commitment and greater funding to help us work to make sure that those existing laws are effective. Further, you've heard that similar legislation 
to what is in front of you today has passed in several other states. We have yet to see any tangible evidence that those efforts with that legislation have been successful in curbing wage theft. To the bill, Mr. Chair, I want to address a very serious principle and a serious provision in the bill for our members, and that is the principle of basic fairness in the imposition of what is called strict liability that this bill brings to bear. The bill shifts legal responsibility for the criminal actions of downstream contracting partners onto the upstream general contractor, regardless of the general contractor's fault or negligence. In spite of what you heard, on large-scale projects, general contractors do not control the hiring of downstream sub and further sub-tier subcontractors. They further lack complicity or responsibility for the negligent or criminal actions of those subs. The application of strict liability in this respect is unprecedented and something our members will not support. At its core, construction and contracting is about managing and pricing risk. Insurance is an important aspect of managing that risk. Mr. Chair and committee members, no insurance product exists today that will cover strict liability imposed on general contractors if this bill passes, because you cannot insure the negligence and criminal actions of another party. In this case, the downstream subcontractors. General contractors will be left to price that uninsurable risk into their projects. This will certainly lead to significant cost increases for construction services. Secondly, we're concerned about equity in public and in private construction in building out a robust women and minority construction community. Should this bill pass, it will be far likely for generals to take on unknown risks by hiring unfamiliar project partners on their project team. General contractors will be forced to demand payment bonds from unfamiliar partners to protect themselves against the risks of wage theft. Obviously, this demand will limit the capacity of women and minority and small businesses because they are the ones that will be challenged to afford the premium and they will not be able to qualify for these types of security instruments. Our final concern, Mr. Chair, with this bill is the administrative burden that it will impose on upstream general contractors to be responsible for collecting and managing and retaining the amounts of, of information that will be required. Significant unaddressed questions remain, for example, what if you have a late, non-compliant, or non-responsive project partner? Leverage in the bill provides the contract, the general contractor, to withhold payment. We can only imagine what kind of disputes may arise when those payments are withheld for lack of information. Finally, there is no discernible method or mechanism in the bill to alert an upstream general contractor that a downstream sub has, has defaulted or uh, has failed to make payment. In some, the general contractor will be held liable. Mr. Chair, in the interest of time, I will uh, reserve my former comments and say we are opposed to this bill until these significant uh, concerns that I've briefly outlined for you today can be addressed to our satisfaction, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Werke, and uh, Wendy Sullivan is the next person on my list. And again, if you can keep, keep it to two to three minutes so we can get through the rest of the testifiers. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. Um, good afternoon. My name is Wendy Sullivan. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I am the owner of Winrich PD Construction. I am a subcontractor. I am um, woman-owned and minority-owned. I am the sole owner um, and certified as such. And I heard about this... Um, bill and I was concerned because I've had so many obstacles in the last nine years to break into construction um, and especially into highway heavy. Um, there are so many barriers that are existing for a small business to try to enter in when a GC or a prime is you know used to working with their same partners 
And in understanding this bill, um, it seems as if this will create another one. Um, I think Tim Workey talked about it a little bit uh, before me, but if I have to get a bond at that point, I'm not large enough or established enough to do that. And so that cuts me out and along with a lot of other minority subcontractors um, to participate in projects, regardless if they have goals, if we aren't able to meet those things that are within there, within that, um, <clears throat> the parameters of getting a bond, they can say that the, the general contractor can say that they put in good faith effort, but we weren't able to meet those, you know, surpass those barriers. And so um, I learned yesterday, just yesterday, that about the bill that was put forth or passed um, in 2019, and that bill s sounded like it got stifled a little bit with actually implementing it because, and there were, someone mentioned that there were zero claims on it. Um, and if no one's reporting anything, how do you know if that, that process works or not? If no one's reported any of these incidents to the, I think it's the Department of Labor and Industry, how do you know, how do we know that that bill doesn't work and it hasn't gone forward enough, it hasn't had enough time? And I said it was stifled because of COVID. Um, and I just learned that yesterday. But the other thing I just want to say is that as I feel responsible for my business and any mistakes that I made and anything that I have to do, I don't hold the general contractor responsible for my business. I have to own that. I have to, I do own it, but I, I have to own it and I have to take responsibility for that no matter how tough that is. And I just want, I guess what I'm here to say is if you could consider a small business when you're making, and minority businesses and women-owned businesses when you're making these decisions, I think the worker is so important. Um, I work 72 hours myself you know, a week trying to keep my business afloat. And if I just think sometimes these bills, we're looking at one thing, just the worker, but the balance of that is the small subcontractor who's trying to make it in this industry. And I just ask that you guys consider this, maybe working with the legislation you have now um, to work through that and see if that works before going into something else that's going to harm small businesses who are trying to break into and emerge into construction. And it's tough. It's really tough to break through those barriers. And this creates another one for us. Um, I thank you for your time, um, and I appreciate you letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Stephen Yoke. And then the next person I have is Bill <coughs> Greshwin. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Take Chairman. Take your name for the record and proceed. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Steve Yoke. I'm an attorney and uh, lawyer in Minneapolis. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about this bill. I have represent many general, many dozens of general contractors and subcontractors over the year. And I've written a lot on real estate and construction issues. I pr in the 30 years that I've practiced in this area, I've never spoken to uh, this legislature about a bill before. But I believe that the proposed bill represents, for many of our small contractors, as you just heard from the prior speaker, an existential threat, and especially, which has not been discussed today, the impact on single family housing, which is already a very tight market, and there's limited affordability. As you may likely know, Minnesota is one of the most heavily regulated areas for, again, I'm going to focus on single family. I think it's worth noting that that has really not been discussed much through the course of these proceedings. But we have a very rigorous 327A statute, which does put uh, responsibilities on the general contractor to monitor and make sure the subcontractor's work is required. Likewise, Minnesota requires that if an owner pays a, a contractor money to pay to somebody else, it's held in trust. And if they don't give that money, they're subject to criminal liability. So we have layers of protection for both homeowners and for contractors. And of course, we've talked a lot about, and I'm not going to repeat the discussion of Chapter 181, the theft by contractor statute, which is appropriate and should be enforced. The current statutory framework that's discussed in this bill presents substantial, there already is substantial protection for homeowners that I don't believe is necessary, but there are things this bill will do. This bill will compel small businesses and to review their subcontractors' records and assume fundamentally something that they don't have responsibility for, that is, interacting with the individual employees of the subcontractors. I would also note, and there was some discussion about other states, this bill is not in any of our border states or a companion type bill. This will have a direct impact on single family home construction in Wisconsin. You can avoid these costs, and some of my clients probably will, to build lower cost single family homes in Wisconsin that will not be able to be built in Minnesota. We will lose that business. Now, I doubt this was the bill's intent, and I'm confident it's not, but the inevitable result of this will be a further consolidation of the con home single-form home construction industry. 
most of the large construction companies are from outside Minnesota, and they may be able to absorb some of these costs that are discussed here. However, the smaller contractors can't. They simply do not have the resources. This will result in less competition and higher prices. <laughs> Finally, I think there's, again, a huge distinction between large commercial projects, which we've talked about today, large multifamily, and single-family home. As written, the burden places an equal burden on all those types of different contractors to understand what their subcontractors are doing, and they're just simply not equipped. This will squeeze out and make cause either housing costs to go up or less people to build low-income housing, which, of course, there's a tremendous shortage. Even if a general contractor under the wrap up, yes, even if the general contractor goes to the expense of the audit here, as was noted by Mr. Workey, there's strict liability. You can be a general contractor and do everything you're supposed to do, and you're still strictly liable. That undermines fundamental fairness. There are narrow exceptions that permit that sort of activity, but they do not exist here. That's the other stitches that we talked about. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, this bill, as currently presented, will have a tremendously adverse impact on single-family homes, which has not been discussed. It'll hurt affordable housing, and I believe it's unwise and should be rejected. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Greshwin? And I probably said that wrong. I've... It's been said many ways, and you are as close as many have been. So <laughs> I appreciate and thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members, my name is Bill Geschwind. I'm the founding attorney of Minnesota Construction Law Services, a boutique law firm serving the legal needs of owner-operated contractors and subcontractors at all tiers throughout Minnesota. I'm an active member and supporter of Housing First Minnesota, Associated Builders of Minnesota and North Dakota, and the Minnesota chapter of the National Association of the, Roofing Indus uh, the Remodeling Industry. Excuse me. It's frustrating to hear the stories you're being told this afternoon. To accuse non-union contractors of rampant wage theft, of hiring immigrants only to exploit them for profits, is reckless, dishonest misinformation. If the allegations made today were true, wouldn't you hear, be hearing about thousands or even just hundreds of court decisions finding that construction workers' wages were stolen? Mm -hmm. I know of one case, Janice V. asked me, where the U.S. Supreme Court found that the, a, a union's mandatory dues are wage theft. You're not hearing about a multitude of wage theft cases in the construction industry because wage theft is not a widespread problem in the construction industry. What do the labor brokers this bill's proponents complain about actually do? Well, let's see, they gather up a pool of workers, they negotiate a labor agreement with a contractor, and they demand a fee from the workers who want one of those jobs. Isn't that precisely what the labor unions do? And don't those unions give the money confiscated from workers to politicians so they'll pass bills like this one, giving unions a monopoly on wage theft? On January 24th of this year, WCCO reported that over the past 13 years, across all industries in Minnesota, there were only 745 claims of wage theft reported to the Department of Labor. Of the worst cases, none were in the construction industry. In a courtroom, when a witness's statements clearly exaggerate, mislead or lie, a jury disregards everything the witnesses say because that witness is not credible. The assertions of rampant wage theft in the construction industry are proved to be untrue by WCCO's investigation. You must ignore everything this bill's proponents are telling you to stop this bill. Our current wage theft law is widely recognized as one of the toughest in the country. For the proponents' claims to be true, you'd have to believe that the Department of Labor and the Attorney General did nothing about construction industry wage theft for the past three years while knowing that 20% of construction workers, mostly immigrants, were being exploited. Is that something that you can believe? Can you come to a conclusion, sir? One final observation. Minnesota statutes and rules mandate that subcontractors alone are responsible for paying wages and taxes for their workers. This bill conflicts with long-held laws and rules in Minnesota by obligating contractors to supervise their subcontractors' payroll and making contractors responsible for their subs' wages and taxes. Mr. Chairman, committee members, I respectfully request that you consider the facts and not the unproven anecdotes of this bill's proponents and oppose this bill. Thank you much for your time. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Uh, Brooke Bordson, and then I have Michelle Dreyer. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair Nelson and members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Brooke Bordson, and I'm with the League of Minnesota Cities, which represents 837 cities across the state. I wanted to just very briefly touch on some concerns about the bill from the perspective of cities. Under the new definitions in the bill, um, starting on line 3.25, a city as a project owner would be deemed a contractor in certain circumstances and liable for all claims as such. Our concern is that cities would end up using public funds to pay for certain costs twice if a contractor didn't pay a subcontractor claim or the payment was in dispute. Because public projects are funded with taxpayer dollars, municipalities are subject to unique requirements under the state's Chapter 471 Uniform Municipal Contracting Law. For most construction projects over $175,000, a city has to bid out the project and accept the lowest responsible bid. The cities are not allowed much discretion in selecting a contractor, and we believe these regulations that apply specifically to municipalities should be taken into consideration when determining whether to make a city financially responsible for a contractor's actions. The Uniform Municipal Contracting Law also requires projects over $175,000 to include a payment bond, um, and that's in uh, 574.26 contractors' bonds for public work. For projects where a payment bond has been obtained, subcontractors and workers can make a claim against the bond for wa wages they're owed. Uh, we would request that language be added to the bill stating that these new provisions would not apply to allow claimants to seek payment from a city when a city has required a contractor to provide a payment bond. Without this, without this exception, there may be confusion about whether a claimant would file two claims or how those claims would proceed. Um, so just in summary, we're concerned that the effects of the bill could pose a financial risk to cities as they plan for and incorporate projects into their budgets. Um, and I really want to thank Representative Feist for taking the time several times to, to speak with me about our concerns and very happy to move to work with her as the bill moves forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Michelle Dreyer, then John Bush. <coughs> and again. State your name and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Nelson, members of the Labor and Industry Finance Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Michelle Dreyer and I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Electrical Association. My association provides education, workforce strategies, and government advocacy for my 257 contractor members, most of whom are small employers throughout the state of Minnesota. Prior to working for the Electrical Association, I worked at the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry, investigating instances of wage theft on prevailing wage projects, as well as general wage theft in other industries. As an individual contributor, as well as through my team of investigators, I am responsible for recovering at least $2 million for exploited workers in minimum wage, overtime, and prevailing wage recovery. I have multiple concerns regarding House File 1859. This bill seeks to prevent exploitation of workers, which I agree is important. My concerns is the way it goes about doing so. I've been working with the author and several of the bill supporters to alleviate those concerns, and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. I have to say in listening to the testimony today, non-payment of taxes is as much or greater concern uh, than wage theft. I've heard many times of uh, payment of cash, which Paying, paying cash is legal, but you have to pay your ta taxes. You have to um, take the records necessary for the employees. It seems that um, the recurring thread here is misclassification of employees as independent contractors. Um, and that's something I did not prepare in my testimony, but that's something that I did see in listening to the testimony of the affected workers today. Since I left DLI in late 2016, there have been many additional tools added to labor standards enforcement, including additional wage theft powers and additional documentation of wage requirements. Law requires workers to know how much they are paid prior to engaging in the work. Uh, Minnesota has strong provisions regarding the misclassification of work and require commercial contractors to register. Residential contractors need to be licensed and therefore also registered. Wage theft provisions give DLI the ability to investigate over and above minimum wage. 
I'm not testifying for Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry, but I do understand the complexities of wage theft and the skills necessary for a successful investigation. DLI does a great job of investigating and collecting and on wage theft. Conclusion. You can come to a sure. conclusion. And is best suited for examination of, of records and compliance and issuing of withholding orders. Um, the investigators also have special training regarding data practices and the sensitive data contained. <clears throat> uh, so one of the things I've seen in uh, listening to the, the other people testimony today is I do believe that uh, DLI is central to address some of the problems that we have heard here today, uh, but there needs to be some good, good uh, collaboration between unemployment and taxation agencies um, in order to address the issues that we've heard. Thanks so much for your time, and I will make myself uh, available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Ryer. Mr. Bosch, Mr. Boucher, I Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. And this is our last testifier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and again, uh, members of the committee for the record, John Beshe, uh, Associated Builders and Contracts, tra Contractors of Minnesota, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on this bill. ABC is opposed to House File 1859 and the requirement that general contractors assume liability for any unpaid wages or fringe benefits owed by a subcontractor of any tier. When the 2019 wage theft bill was signed into law, advocates celebrated it as one of the toughest wage theft laws in the country. It was supposed to provide the Department of Labor and the Attorney General with the tools needed to crack down on wage theft, and it created criminal liability for intentional fraudulent wage theft. Now, I want to be absolutely clear that ABC does not condone wage theft, and we believe that every worker deserves to get paid. However, H House File 1859 paints all general contractors with a broad stroke and will punish merit shop contractors while providing carve outs for union contractors and contractors on prevailing wage projects. If an employee takes legal action against the subcontractor of any tier, this bill will make the general contractor jointly and severally liable for unpaid wages, benefits, and liquidated damages. If that subcontractor is unable or refuses to pay, the general contractor will then be stuck with those costs. This assumption of liability is unfair to general contractors who have no knowledge of what may have transpired between subcontractors and their employees or even what will happen in the future. The general contractor does not sit on the HR or accounting divisions of the dozens and dozens of subcontractors that they work with on every single project. The ultimate effect of this bill will be to punish innocent parties for the bad actions of others. It's been said that this bill is needed to tilt the playing field so that it is even between general contractors and employees. However, ABC is concerned that this approach seems to only apply to non-union general contractors as the bill explicitly permits the assumption of liability to be waived by a collective bargaining agreement with the trade union. We were able to quickly review the author's amendment prior to committee, and while we do appreciate that it adds some more clarity and specification regarding the CBA exemption, we remain concerned as to whether the Department of Labor will have any oversight or enforcement mechanisms to ensure that proper wages and benefits get paid. From a practical standpoint, we are concerned that if the liability requirements in this bill can be waived by a collective bargaining agreement, a merit shop general contractor who hires a union subcontractor would still have to assume liability and could be held jointly and severally liable for those wages. Even if the union subcontractor CBA includes a grievance process, could a merit shop general contractor still be held jointly liable for wages? If so, the likely result will be that merit shop general contractors will avoid doing business with union subcontractors out of fear that they may need to assume the liability for unpaid wages. If the trades unions here are okay with that idea, we can let our general contractors know. Uh, in closing, again, ABC believes that every worker deserves to get paid, and we would like to see DLI enforce the wage theft laws that are currently on the books and hold the bad actors accountable for their actions. In closing, we urge the committee to vote no on House File 1859. Thank you again, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And, and members, just so you know, we're going to move House File 2213 until next week. Um, we're going to finish this bill up today. Um, I've got Opening up for discussion, I have Representative Myers, first uh, person. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Uh, I just want to say thank you to all the testifiers and really say thank you to Representative Feiss. Um, 
you know, I love to hear when people come in here and say that you're willing to meet with them and you're talking to all different sides. Um, I will say I've had many conversations, several with uh, Mr. Dunnick, uh, advocates, carpenters, general contractors in regards to the operation of this bill. Um, and, I, and I appreciate everybody advocating and looking at all the different sides. You know, what I will say is that um, every single person should be compensated for their hard work. And, you know, general contractors shouldn't be unjustly enriched for uh, employers not, or employees not being paid. The question I have specifically for you, does this bill address that if a general pays the subcontractor um, all, you know, the money or a, a lot of the money already for the services provided, does that mean that the employees can still come back around to the general contractor so that they're already, you know, if they've already paid once or a, a majority of it once, uh, they're gonna come back around and have to pay it again? Representative Feist. Yeah, thank you, and and thank you for the question. So, so this um, bill covers the relationship between the general contractor and the subcontractor, um, and the workers to the employ the direct employer. So, um, your question is: Will the workers then be able to like skip up and sue the general contractor as part of this bill? So I, do, you know, I. I Myers. Thank you. Uh, I reached out to, you know, a few generals and they said, you know, the way that we run our business sometimes is that we pay our sub the amount to get the work done. If that work gets done, but the sub doesn't pay their employees, now I'm going to be left with the employees coming back up to me again. And so now I'm left, you know, with two bags that I've paid. And I just didn't know if that had this is addressed in that bill. Again, it's an operational question. Repres Representative Feist. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. I feel like that is not how this bill functions. I feel like that is more of just general commercial litigation, and I would be happy to turn it over to Mr. Dunnick, who I don't know. Oh, did, would you be able to answer that on a more technical level? Forgive me, I am a lawyer, but I'm an immigration lawyer, and I don't know the answer. Welcome back, Mr. Dunnick, if you could quickly answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Myers. I, I don't know the exact answer to that question. My understanding is that most, under most cir circumstances, um, there would be an agreement between the general and sub about the timing of payment. So mo in general, what we see in our industry is that the, the contractors don't pay the sub before the work gets done. They pay it in, in phases or in stages. And that that sort of arrangement would be worked out between them before workers. So there wouldn't be a situation where subs have been fully paid, but then the workers aren't paid. Representative Myers. So what I would ask is if Representative Feist would be able to consider that situation, because that, again, I'm not going to take credit for that, but I've talked to a few contractors that said that is the case with some of the people that they do work with. Um, so again, you know, we want to make sure workers are paid, that general contractors aren't unjustly enriched. Um, but I would like to see if potentially we could look into taking that into account. Representative Feist. Thank you. We definitely want this bill to function as intended, and I would be very happy to work with you and, and with uh, other lawyers who don't just practice immigration law to make sure that this, this all plays out appropriately. So thank you for that, that feedback. Thank you. Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sort of similar uh, question for the author. If a sub that I hire, and I have a contract, I have a subcontractor agreement with them, I have a contract with the building owner, usually the homeowner in my case. And if my sub who does exteriors, he may hire a sub who does metal bending. So under this, if my sub does not pay that sub, would I then be obligated to pay that sub? Representative Feist. So the way this bill functions is that we are placing the liability with the person at the top of this pyramid of contracts and subcontracts, and that would be the general contractor or the owner who enters into those agreements. And so, so yes, we are placing liability on the person, the party with the most control over um, ensuring that there is no wage theft. Mr. Mr. Chair, right. so under that scenario, and that's exactly how I read this as well. Mm -hmm. The interesting part is I keep hearing about wage theft, which nobody likes, but that second layer sub is an invoice. In that invoice includes all his metal. It includes his insurance cost. It is not solely all wage. Who is going to take the, the ownership to figure out how much of that would have actually been his wage? And if, I have to, if I've already paid my sub that has allegedly not paid him, 
then I have to pay it again. Is that not stealing my wage? Representative Feist. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question. So this bill provides power to the general contractor to have access to the information that they need to ensure that the subs beneath them are not engaging in wage theft. And so there is access to actual records. So we are putting information and power along with that liability into the hands of the general contractor to ensure that they, they are able to identify wage theft when it occurs. And, and we're placing that responsibility on the general contractor as well. Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Doesn't this strongly conflict with the nine point subcontractor agreement or checklist that you are basically telling us that we have full knowledge and authority over everything that they do below me when they run their own private business? Aren't I put it, being forced to interject myself into their private business, which at what point are they no longer a subcontractor? Representative Feist. So my understanding of the way that the industry works and industry experts can jump in is that there's a lot of transparency already when people are placing bids so that they understand, um, you know, how much the, the drywall um, hours are going to be billed out at, how much the material is going to cost. So a lot of this information, while they might not have it on paper, is a known set of data when they're deciding which subcontractors to hire. Um, so we are providing them access to documentation to ensure that the subcontractors are ethically and accurately reporting their costs. Um, and, and that is what we're doing here. So that information is not private, secret, proprietary information. It is already information that the parties entering into this contract have access to. And Mr. Dunnett can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I believe that's well, how Mr. Chair, I'm Representative, if I could Mr. try to attempt to answer the question the other way, which is to say the other situation we see is where there are just layers and layers of subcontracting that are just intentionally done to <coughs> confuse who is an employee, who is not whether they're an independent contractor or whether or not who they work for, who's making decisions about their time and schedule and those sorts of things. So that, that's what we're trying to get away from. Representative Mecklen, one more question. I've got, I've got other people who have questions. Um, well, Mr. Chair, I appreciate that. But this, this is a very complex bill that is going to affect a lot of things. And I think the, all these questions are pretty important. Can Tim Werke come down and help answer this question? Mr. Werke. Quickly. We're running a little over time here and we're, we've been granted some. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, again, for the record, Tim Warkey, Associated General Contractors, I can answer this very quickly. Yes, that's how we read the bill. That a general contractor would be responsible for lower tier subs who violate the wage, criminally violate the wage theft law, assuming that responsibility up onto them jumping over what would be called or termed second or midterm subs. You can have a general who subs to a sub who subs to a sub, and that sub, sub, sub down the chain who commits the wage theft, according to our read of the bill, would jump over, the liability for that payment would jump over everyone else in the string to the general contractor. And the general contractor cannot procure an, insurement, an insurance instrument to protect against that. Thank you, Mr. Wirkia. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I guess I have a question for you before you, uh, before you leave, Mr. Mr. Wirkia. she's got a question. Can you point yeah. to me where in the bill uh, it discusses your concern about criminal liability? Mr. Wirkia. Madam Chair, I say that in respect to the 2019 wage theft law, which criminalized wage theft, made it a criminal offense versus a civil offense. Representative Greenman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I understand that there's another law in the books, but this law has to do with civil liability, and you're talking about how it impacts criminal liability. I, one, think that that would be a constitutional problem. I also don't see that in this bill. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Representative, I, I guess I mean that in the context of the criminal action of the perpetrator of the wage theft. And the, the action would be the thieving of the wages that the now upstream general would be responsible for paying and would, from the general's perspective, have already paid those wages by paying their subcontractor. And again, in this bill, it allows up to a three-year cause of action to be brought. So that subcontractor could be out of business or have closed their doors for three years and a claim could be brought to that general contractor 
for the non-payment of those wages for which the general had already paid that sub for those wages and now would be responsible for paying those wages and penalties a second time. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think we need to be really clear about when we're talking about criminal liability versus civil liability. And I think that this bill is very clear that impacts civil liability. I also just want to point us to the provision from the previous conversation about sort of responsibility, because we've talked about that before, right? The responsibility of general contractors and subcontractors. We talked about that in the context of the duty to defend. But here, if you look at um, uh, 4.18, the provision of this section does not pro prohibit a contractor or subcontractor from enforcing a contractual provision or other lawful remedies against a subcontractor for monetary damages incurred by the contractor pursuant to the section. I think what this bill does is it says if the subcontractor is is not paying people wages, if they're not doing that, the general contractor has legal remedies to go get it. But, but in this context, the, the general contractor is in the best position to um, enforce those, uh, um, it, to have that, ensure that, that those rights are being enforced. And then the other thing I would just say is, um, I think it's really important. One, thank you workers for, um, uh, for folks who shared their stories. Uh, but what's really important is that these big contractors are making money off of the, the behavior and the misconduct of subcontractors. Because when these, when these uh, um, uh, contracts are being bid out, right, they're being bid out based on this conduct. So the, the general contractors absolutely have a, right, uh, a responsibility to be vetting what their subcontractors are doing. That should be based into the price that they're asking for. Um, and so I, I really strongly support this bill. I think that this gets it, it right in terms of civil liability. And I think it, it, it to, I think what we heard, um, uh, the best force of enforcement is compliance, and that's what we're hopefully doing here. So I really appreciate that, uh, um, the bill, and just wanted to make sure we corrected the record about what the bill actually does. Thank you. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. Just for the record, not all big contractors are big, big companies. Many are family-owned businesses. I have several in Ray County. But I have a couple questions for uh, the commissioner of uh, Dolly. Blissenbeck, if she's available. Ms. Blissenbeck, if you come down and again state your name for the record, and we're going to get another five minutes here, and then we're going to vote on this bill um, before before quarter two. So, very good, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair Nelson and Representative McDonald, my name is Nicole Blissenbeck. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry. Representative McDonald, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, thanks for coming down. Uh, subcontractors work very hard in their profession, be it uh, electrician, plumbing, uh, construction, block lane, you name it. They have a reputation as well. Uh, and if they're not paying their employees, uh, then they won't be in business much. I have many family and friends that are in the trades, and uh, especially in a small community like uh, Wright County and Delano, you do the hard work, you pay your employees, and you will have a successful business uh, ongoing for many years to come, especially the trades. Are you kidding? You're going to do... Fantastic. I'm very happy that my son is in the plumbing industry and he's doing very well at 23. But I digress. Uh, you know, how many of these uh, cases are being reported to Dolly? Um, and I'm not going to beat up on Dolly at all. Uh, I think uh, you're doing good work and I presume you're still doing good work because in 2019 we passed uh, the toughest nation, toughest laws in the nation for wage theft. And I think you have seven new investigators, I believe, seven or eight. And uh, I don't know how many millions of dollars that were allocated in 2019. I hope I voted for that uh, in 2019. I'm sure I did. Um, but uh, I'll look later. Uh, but with, I think it was $3 million get your, corporations. Get to your question. So what, what percentage of their, of their, uh, are there bad actors out there? And uh, if so, are there, you know, we hear some testimony. Are the investigators doing the work and investigating for the claims that there's wage theft going on in Minnesota, and especially in the construction industry, because Representative Feist's uh, bill pertains just to that. Commissioner. Chair Nelson, Representative McDonald. Um, so we do investigate wage theft claims in all industries. Um, we have investigations in, I would say, almost every industry, I feel like, does uh, touch on the department. There are specifically challenges uh, uh, to the con to investigating wage theft th claims in the construction industry. Some of those were touched upon um, by the testifiers today. Um, I'll just 
touch on a couple uh, to be short. Sorry, Chair. Um, one is, as as I think you heard from a number of testifiers, oftentimes in the construction industry, it's hard to, for an, an employee to even identify who their employer is. Um, and that is a that is because of the construct of the multiple layers um, that are existing in the contracting uh, on a project. So that's one. Um, and the current law, the way it works is it's the employer who's responsible for the wages. Um, so if we can't identify who that employer is, um, or once we do identify uh, that employer is gone, um, bankrupt, uh, can't be contacted, it makes the likelihood of recovering those unpaid wages virtually zero. Um, and so that is a challenge that we face, uh, especially when we're uh, investigating uh, allegations of wage theft in the construction industry, um, just because of the challenges that are unique to that industry that we don't see in other industries. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then, Commissioner, how often is that happening in the last, uh, I'll give it maybe three years? Since 2019, we passed it, give it a year to get acclimated. So we got three years. How many reports and investigations have you done in, in the industry uh, regarding wage theft? Commissioner. Uh, Chair Nelson, um, Representative McDonald, I, am, I can't give you a number. I would have to go back and check on that. Um, you know, we, uh, we, in, we investigate claims as they come in. We have to, as uh, complaints come in, we always have to consider our resources. Um, and so if we uh, are looking at a complaint and we see that there could be something there and we look into it and we determine that the likelihood of recovering wages um, is not there. That is something we take into consideration in determining where we're going to go with a with a complaint. And I, I feel bad saying that, to be honest. But our resources are what they are. Um, the challenges that we have in certain industries are what they are, and we have to uh, we have to work with that. Final question, Representative McDonald. Final question, Rep uh, Commissioner. So, if Dolly is having a hard time finding who these subcontractors are, employers. Uh, don't you expect that it would be uh, very difficult for the general contractors also to do so? And in this case, if our own Dolly, who has tax dollars and millions of dollars and several, uh, several investigators to find out who these subs are, uh, it seems very unfair that the general contractor should be expected to do so as well if this uh, Representative Feist bill becomes law. It seems to be very unfair, wouldn't you agree? Commissioner? Chair Nelson, Representative McDonald, um, I do think that there are uh, the contracting that is in place in the construction industry where you do know who you're contracting with. Um, I think it, it definitely puts a, a general contractor and subcontractors in an advantage uh, in determining who's responsible for what work on a construction project. Representative Feist, if you want to give a wrap up. Uh, Mr. Chair, before Representative Feist back, I would request a roll call on House roll, File 1859. Roll call has been requested. Representative Feist, if you want to give a wrap up. Yep, thank you so much. So. Briefly. Briefly, I have, I have five points, but I put a four and a half between four and five, but I'll be efficient. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a moment that we had here where we had two workers come and share their stories of wage theft that happened to them and family members. And then we had another testifier get up here and say, there is no wage theft. <laughs> they said, why aren't there thousands of cases? And the reason there are not thousands of cases is because people aren't listening to these voices. Mm. Um, they do not have power in this dynamic. They oftentimes are relying on their, their employers for their housing. Um, they are uniquely vulnerable and uniquely voiceless workers. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying that all um, general contractors are bad actors, or, and I don't think anybody wants wage theft to be a thing in this room. Um, but there is something about the business model that is uniquely vulnerable to wage theft because we do have these layers of contractors, subcontractors, sub, sub, subcontractors. Um, and so we need to be uniquely proactive in addressing wage theft in the construction industry. Um, civil liability is a strong motivator. Um, we have tried to also go criminal liability route. Um, that really hasn't worked out as Representative McDonald's 
questions really highlighted. Um, and we need to do more and we need to do better by these workers. Um, California passed uh, a similar law uh, the longest ago of the many other states that have passed laws like this. The sky did not fall. Uh, small minority and business uh, women owned subcontractors still exist in California um, and wage theft is down. So, so this type of law has proven to be effective in other states and I'm excited to bring it to Minnesota. Um, I, as you mentioned, like I will talk to anybody. I will continue these conversations. I believe in good governance. I want this bill to function as intended. I'm a business owner. I have a law firm, 10 employees, so I, I don't want to create chaos for businesses, and I'm, I'm excited to continue those conversations. Um, this bill is really important. Um, we are putting power with the workers who have the least control over their situation, um, and we are putting responsibility on the hands of general contractors who have the most power and information. We are giving them more information and access access to, to the, the, the documentation that they need to know that they are contracting with um, ethical subcontractors. And I would encourage everyone to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Foist. And members, to the person that said there's does, it's not happening in the industry, back a couple years ago when I was an apprentice, it happened to me. And it happened to the contractor I worked for. And uh, so I've witnessed this in, on first hand. And uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Bauman, would you take take the roll? Chair Nelson? Aye. Nelson, aye. Vice Chair Berg? Aye. Berg, aye. Lead McDonald? Nay. McDonald, nay. Representative Daniels? Nay. Daniels, <clears throat> nay. Representative Greenman? Aye. Greenman, aye. Representative Hill? Aye. Hill, aye. Good Representative Hussein? Aye. Hussein, aye. Representative Jordan? Aye. Jordan, aye. Representative Koslowski? Aye. Koslowski, aye. Representative Meckland? Nay. Meckland, nay. Representative Myers? Aye. Myers, aye. Representative Schultz? Aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Wolgamott is excused. Mr. Chair, with the conclusion of roll call, there are nine ayes and three nays. Nine ayes and three ayes. The motion. And I bid, 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 bid say this that I renew my motion at House File 1859. We refer to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. And with a vote of nine to three, the, bill, the motion prevails.